Right, far away. You had a lot of memorable, memorable moments about it. Where, where does calling last year's brawl bring on that? That had to have been a very fun one. So the question, that's what I wanted to start with out here. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, it was, as far as broadcasting is concerned, I mean, calling the Super Bowl, calling the playoff games is one thing. I mean, obviously, uh, at the NFL level, you're talking about the very highest level, but in terms of emotion, and how personally invested you feel in a broadcast. Uh, when Devin Shire returned to pick six, it was very emotional. I had to kind of step back for a minute. If you notice, you know, if you replay the broadcast, we all kind of went silent because the camera crews would just pan down to the student section, and it was a mob of blue and yellow. And that was something I don't think you've seen here. I don't know if ever, especially of that magnitude in terms of how many people were in that stadium that day. And the raw emotion that was coming out that day. So for me, it was very hard for me to remain neutral in that game, so to speak. I got a lot of flack on Twitter from West Virginia's uh, fan base about me being too impartial. I tried my best look. I, I think I did a pretty good job of, of remaining pretty neutral, but there were moments where it was really, really hard. Um, because that for me, look, I had not been to a pit football game since I played last in 1990 against uh, Penn State. Uh, so to actually come back to a game and have it be that game against that team in particular with that crowd, it kind of made me also think about 1989 when we went down to Morgantown and we were both ranked in the top 10. And that was probably the most emotional game I'd ever played in my career, you know, Pop Warner, high school, college, or pro. And it, that was probably the most emotional night of my life because we were getting just absolutely trounced that night down 31 and nine, nine minutes left in the game, and we come back and tie the game. I remember walking off the field that night, crying and having Mark Spindler kind of put his arm around me saying, this is why we came here, to, to play in games like this. And that's what that reminded me of being there. Because I, I could see the past, you know, everybody in that, I mean, there were people crying in the stands that night when, when Devin Chai returned that, because and that's what college football's about, that's what we need to preserve about college football, are those kind of games that produce those kind of moments. So. The powers that, that, that be need to get together and make sure they do. Lewis, with Revis getting in the Hall of Fame this year, yeah. that's three from Aliquippa, ten from Pitt. Mm -hmm. What does that say about Western PA football, this program, and how it can develop players that can go to the NFL and do that kind of yeah, thing? Western PA's uh, history has been established well before even Durrell, and Durrell just kind of like obviously builds on that. Um, Eastern PA football is not too bad either. Now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Pittsburgh. I say this all the time when I talk to other guys at ESPN or just other people around the country about college football. Our all-time team can match up against anyone's, absolutely anyone's, whether it be USC, Notre Dame, Oklahoma, it doesn't matter who. And those greats love to see what they built back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, continue to be built upon by guys like Durrell, by guys like you know, Larry Fitzgerald here in the future. I mean, they, they want to see that. They want to see greatness continued. And, and they are, they're not envy of it, envious of it. They don't try to protect their turf. They just want to see it expand and grow and grow and grow. And because it's, it's good for everyone. I mean, there, there's something about your school continuing to show excellence, especially when we're talking about football, that is very unique. I mean, guys in the NFL, when they sit around in locker rooms and they talk amongst themselves, they don't really talk about the pro game. They talk about where they went to school, how good the players are from their school, how proud they are about their school. And when we're talking about pit football, it's second to none. Lewis, you told me when we talked in July at DeMar's celebrity that you went to the cathedral and just sat in there for a half hour. Uh, what does this university mean to you? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things I would impress upon people here who are at Pittsburgh now or at, at any school is while you're there, be present really understand kind of what your four years or five years or six years for some people are, are about when you're in college. I don't know if I did that enough when I was here. And so I try to circle back and do it more now because the cathedral is one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture in the United States and the world, quite honestly. It's an, all, it's an awesome building when you just sit there and you look straight up and you see just how, really just how beautiful it is and what it represents to this university. Everybody who talks, look, everything about the University of Pittsburgh kind of starts there. Every picture that really wants to um, embody what Pittsburgh is all about, that's the picture. That's the, that's, the, that's the place that people go to. So when I went in there and I saw, you know, there were families in there who were walking around with students who were kept touring, maybe some kids who were gonna be here in the, in the fall and all. And everyone's eyes were just as big as saucers, just kind of looking up and looking around. 
I am just and I've been in that place. I had moment, and we all had classes in that place. I spent a lot of time in that place as a student, but I never looked at it the same way that I looked at it when I went back there just a couple weeks ago and was looking at it. Especially considering it's been 32 years since I left here, and it felt like I was a freshman again, just sitting there looking around. It, it's it's cool. Since What's you your thoughts about the state of college football with uh, realignment, at, uh, uh, yeah. NIL, and transfer portals? Look, um, the powers that be need to do everything that they can to preserve the rivalries in college football. It's why we love college football. It's the pageantry, the history, the emotion that's involved. And the first thing I told you is like the most memorable game of my college career is Pitt, West Virginia, 1989. After that, it's Pitt, Penn State, 1987. It's Pitt, Penn State, 1989, when we played on here in Pittsburgh and there was a big fight at the end of the game because we thought we were gonna win that game. We threw an interception late and lost the game. But college football, to me, is about those traditions and about those, that history. And right now, it, I, don't, I don't really know where it falls in the pecking order in terms of importance. Right now, we know what's at the, at the top of the list in the pecking order. It's money. It's making sure that we are in a position to compete both now and in the future for as long as we possibly can. And a lot of that is driven by money. The more money you can make, the better facilities you can have, the more kids with the advent of NIL will want to be to want to come to your school because for some well, look, the kids aren't doing anything wrong by them trying to maximize their earnings potential in college because that's what universities are doing. Do I like it? No. Do I understand it? Yeah. Do I blame anybody for it? No. It just needs to be regulated and uniform, and certain things need to be preserved about the game. Otherwise, you're going to wind up ruining it. Look, I, I, I'm calling college football games, and I have continued to increase my profile calling college football games because I love the pageantry of the game, okay? I don't necessarily care about seeing Pitt play Cal, Pitt play Stanford, Stanford play Florida State. I don't care about that. I want to see Pitt play Penn State, Pitt play West Virginia. I want to see Ohio State play Michigan. I want to see those games be preserved. And that's what the people who right now are making the decisions better make sure they keep in the back of their minds. Otherwise, there are a lot of purist college football fans like myself out there who will wind up, the, wind up getting turned off to the game if it just becomes about what's in it for us, how much money can we make. Let's so be careful with that. When, when, when you look at the success Pitt has had over the last two seasons, 20, 20 wins, you see this, the energy of every shot pick. What has yeah. Pat Narduzzi done that you've seen to reinstill this, that this kind of success and pride in the program? It's, a, it's culture building. I mean, I mean, everyone talks about it, right? When you hear that ad nauseum in sports, culture, culture, culture. Well, you know how Pat is when you talk to him. I mean, that's kind of how he is. You know, he doesn't give you something and then behind closed doors give everyone else something else. He's a hard-nosed, tough-ass dude who wants his teams to be like that. That's how they play. Those are the kind of kids he recruits. He's not going after every single five-star and four-star that comes in believing as though they're a first ballot Hall of Famer already. He wants guys who want to earn it. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't want guys who are talented, but that's what he wants. He wants guys who will earn it, guys who will buy into his system, guys who will take care of their brothers, guys who will do the dirty work, the guys who have high football character. Look at some of the players that have come out of here recently. When I was just back at DeMar's uh, charity softball game, you tell me a better group of guys than Dane Jackson, uh, DeMar Hamlin, Aaron Donald, um, Tyler Boyd, James Conner. These are A-plus people. Forget the football part. They're A-plus people. And when they come back, like the hugs, the embraces, the, the exchanges of, uh, you know, of pleasantries are real. It's not just, well, I went to school with you, let me, let me, you know. No, these guys all, I mean, when I see them, like, I don't want to be a lot of their dads. <laughs> a lot of their dads. But they talk, we talk like we were on the team together. And I played 30, 25 years before them. But when I see Alex Van Pelt, if I see Sean Gilbert, um, when I talk to Burt Grossman on the phone, or I see him, like, these are my guys. So this, that's kind of what Pitt is. That's what Pitt's always been. Um, would you like to see it translate more to national success? Of course. But you have to, have, you have to build what Pat's trying to build first before you can get to that, okay? That, that's part of the process. And, and uh, look, Pat isn't for everyone. He's for me. I, I like what he's trying to do. I like the kind of kids he has recruited. I like the character that this team plays with. Lewis, we've got a couple more minutes. 
comments here. I know Amanda, you had a question mm -hmm. from Amanda and uh, Noah. Corey, we got to make it quick. Mm -hmm. um, Lewis, as a former defensive back, there have been four, I think, four the last five years, a defensive back from Pitt has been drafted. Mm -hmm. um, what have you seen about uh, Coach Narduzzi's scheme, and why do you think those uh, de Pitt defensive backs are attractive to NFL teams? Well, other than the skill piece, which is obviously, you know, standard in the NFL, right? You have to be strong, fast, have great change of direction, ball skills, all that stuff. I think Pat likes people who are smart, who can retain a lot of information, can adjust on the fly, don't make mistakes. Look, you're living on the Autobahn back there. Okay, things go real, real fast. And either you're at the front of the pack and everything's good, or you're in a wreck, and the next thing you know, you're wrecking things for your game. And I think he, he knows what kind of people he's looking for. He coaches them a certain way. He understands that they're going to be put in some very, um, let's just say, high-pressure situations because of the way he likes to play defense. And uh, the NFL values that. The NFL values guys who are smart, don't make a lot of mistakes, dependable off the field, and who have been put in high pressure situations before because it doesn't get any more high pressure than dealing with Patrick Mahomes on Sunday. So that's the kind of people you're looking for. You know what? Corey. Year two in the NFL for Kenny Pickett. What are your expectations for him? How does he take that next step? The sky's the limit. But Kenny, Kenny's doing exactly what you expect Kenny to do. Again, talk about football character. Personal character. Is there a better person than Kenny Pickett? You tell me. Um, he will advance cerebrally, mentally, because that's what happens from year one, year two, when you're able to back off, kind of break down your game, break down the opponent's game, and kind of understand how you fit into your own offense and how you can get better. He's done that. Physically, he's maturing still. The team's gotten better around him. You've seen how George Pickens looks. George Pickens is going to go to the Pro Bowl this year. George Pickens may be a first team All Pro. And that's not even talking about how good Deontay Johnson is, Pat Farmuth is, Najee Harris is. They've got studs everywhere. But Kenny is that guy who stands up straight, squares shoulder, looks people in the eye, and the team respects it. They respect it from day one. Mike talks about that. You guys talk to Mike Tomlin. Ask Mike what he thinks of Kenny. He loves it. Kenny's going to shut a lot of people up this year who said that, uh, you know, he's just, a, he's just a good college quarterback who wears two gloves, can't push the ball down the field, all that BS. He's going to – I'm going to have fun with this one on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, thank you so much.